good morning, everybody. I want to make sure that we get some decent questions here, so I have a little bit of an incentive. Yeah, I have a Raspberry Pi. Ooh. Ah. Uh, it, it's a... Um, Two or three or something. <laughs> I don't know. I've never used it. That's why I'm giving it away. <laughs> In great, fine. Yeah, nobody gets it then. Uh, no, best question gets, gets the Raspberry Pi. And that includes the questions asked um, while other people are actually presenting. So uh, we've got 90 minutes. Uh, the only reason why I'm doing this is because I've never had the opportunity to speak uninterrupted for 90 minutes before. Uh, I hope you'll ask questions um, as they come to you because we've got a lot of information to cover. Um, it's not the simplest uh, situation in the world. So again, feel free to interrupt and we'll, we won't cover everything, but we'll try to get you uh, sufficiently uh, intrigued that you'll want to go off and make the world better for security. So, he said, making sure that his fiendish thingy is working. Aha. It helps if you plug in the dongle. There we go. This time for sure. Nothing up my sleeve, presto. So why do you want to write a Linux security module? I mean, we got great ones already. Um, we've got Smack and SE Linux and App Armor and Tomoyo and Yama, LoadPin, SafeSet, Safe, Safe Set SID. Uh, we've got a couple more that are uh, coming down the pike. And so really, why would you want to do it? Um, and of course, writing kernel code is hard. Uh, you have to deal with all those community people. So there are times when a Linux security module is actually the easiest way to accomplish um, the things that you want to do. Okay, I just want to let everybody know that that is annoying me as much as it's annoying you, the, the bandsaw in the next room. Um, all right, so why, so, when is a Linux security module the right choice? Uh, I hear you cry. Uh, if you want to add access control decisions, uh, access control restrictions to your existing system, that's what a Linux security module is for. And you want to do it to things that are controlled by the kernel. Um, things like files and processes, um, system 5 IPC objects, um, socket delivery. And if you want to do mandatory access control, this is about the only place you can do it because it's the only place where we actually have all the information about all of the things you might want to, to deal with. So one of the most important things to, to realize about uh, security modules is that they implement restrictive controls. So the traditional controls are still done. You still have to pass the mode bit checks. If you have access control lists, you still have to pass those. Um, but you can base your access control checks on any of that information. Um, so the UID checks are based, capability checks are still done. Um, if there are other LSMs, you may have to wait and see that their checks are done. And you can't override a denial. So you cannot write an LSM that says, I, wanna, I know that any user ID that's odd, an odd number, is okay, so you know, in spite of the fact that that user ID wouldn't have access to a file, go ahead and let it happen anyway. You can't do that with an LSM. LSMs are restrictive, che rest rest <laughs> restrictive checks. So when is a Linux security module the wrong choice? Um, if you want to change the access control restrictions of the system, you can't do that with an LSM. Uh, the Best example of this are POSIX access control lists, which you cannot implement as an LSM because they actually change the behavior of the mode bits. So if you tried to do it, um, 
if you tried to do access control lists as an LSM, you would discover that there were denials being coming and you weren't expecting because they'd get to the mode bits, the mode bits would say, no, you can't do that. And then you get to the access control list, which would have, uh, which would have granted you access and you can't, you will never have gotten there. Uh, the other thing is readily done in user space. How many of you remember Dbus? Remember KDBus? Excuse me. KDBus. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there's a, there's a smattering of people over here. Uh, you don't do KDBus. I'm sorry. You don't do Dbus in the kernel because it's readily done in user space. It's a lot easier to do things that you can do in user space, typically, in user space. And there are a lot of other advantages to doing them in user space. So uh, if you can readily do it in user space, if it's the kind of thing that you would do in user space, don't try to put it in the kernel. So what are the alternatives? Well, there are a lot of security mechanisms, believe it or not, in the Linux kernel. Um, some people even say there might be too many. Sometimes you run into conflicts. So one of the alternatives is special, special purpose file systems. If you want to encrypt your files, you don't do that in an LSM. Uh, you write, write a, put it to your file system code. Or you have a file system, uh, ecryptfs, uh, uh, ecryptfs that sits on top of everybody else. Or you do it in the block layer. You just don't do it uh, in an LSM. We also have these, these cool things called namespaces, uh, which offer a variety of ways to, to do separation. Uh, so you can have processes that are isolated from each other. Um, and because there are enough people talking about containers and other, other uh, venues, we won't go into that too deeply. But that's one of the alternatives. Um, you can do network namespaces. You can do file system namespace, you can do user namespaces. There's all kinds of good stuff you can do with that. We also have a system, uh, have a, a mechanism called seccomp. And if what you want to do is stuff that is oriented towards system calls, seccomp is the way to go. And if you want to do bizarre and unnatural things with seccomp that it doesn't already do, and there are a few, um, that would be a place to enhance if you, uh, you know, want to do it at the system call granularity because that's where it, it's oriented. If you want to do packet filtering, we have NetFilter, um, whereby packet com comes in the system. You can do virtually anything you want to it under virtually any circumstances. It's really magic. Uh, and then we have BPF and eBPF, which are brand new and I don't really understand as well as I ought to, but they're new and cool and, and uh, magical, magical thingies. Uh, that you can use in, in some circumstances in order to, to do things that are oriented toward, toward small, small programs embedded in the kernel. So security module don'ts, and I apologize profusely that the picture is missing. Um, I couldn't find a really good picture for this. So you don't want to duplicate an existing security module. Uh, we do have several, again, you, we have generic Mac systems. We have three generic Mac systems. Um, we have SE Linux, which is um, granular. We have SMAC, which is simpler. And we have AppArmor, which is oriented more toward usability than it is toward objects and subjects and um, provable correctness. If I, does that sound about right? Okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> that's, that's the nice, nice thing about John is he's amenable to just about being, saying just about anything, okay. Um, another thing you wanna be really care careful with if you're gonna do a security module is don't count on a user mode helper, really. It's like if, if you're gonna make a security decision, think about how many of those you can make in a second. If you're going to make a security decision, you're gonna call up to a helper and say, hey, helper, what should I do? And the helper's got this gigabyte database. It's going boom. And it's going, here, I know how to make my decisions based on all this, this learned data that I've accumulated over the past 10 years. And I'm gonna think about it for about 10 seconds and say, yes. Your system's gonna to come to a screeching halt and you're gonna have all kinds of locking issues and nobody's going to love you. 
So don't put a whole lot of faith in user space helpers. Uh, we've seen several things suggested that do that, and they all have this problem where they end up getting locked as soon as the second process starts. Uh, the other thing is don't inflame the community. Um, and there are lots of good ways to do that. Um, it's actually pretty easy. Um, so when you come in with a security module, it needs to make sense. You know, wacky things don't get a lot of good coverage. You know, wacky things um, tend to get a lot of derisive response. Uh, good example, somebody pr recently proposed a security module that would do nothing but look at the path names, and if there was a space in the path name, reject it. Um, actually, very, very useful. But the, a lot of the people in the community thought that this, you know, because this violated POSIX semantics and other trivial things, um, that this was probably not a good idea. So when you're going to propose something, you make sure that it makes, makes a modicum of sense not just for your particular use case, but in general. Uh, okay, so that said, let's talk about designing your security module. Because really, it kind of makes sense to do that. Uh, I know that a lot of fields in computer, in, uh, in software development these days, we don't design things. We just uh, throw, throw stuff onto the disk, and if we like it, it two weeks afterwards, then we we try to publish it, put it out on GitHub. But it really does make sense when you're dealing with security to design what it is you want it to accomplish. So the first thing you have to figure out is what do you want to protect? Uh, kind of an obvious thing, but you know, what, what matters? You know, do you want to protect objects on the file system? Do you want to restrict path names, like this, this one LSM proposed it doing? Do you want to protect the interaction between processes? Do you want to protect what a process, individual process can and can't do uh, under circumstances? Uh, do you want to do things like uh, keep track of the number of times a program accesses the number of things in Etsy? And if it looks at things in Etsy more than twice, then you say, yeah, no, I, I don't trust this program anymore. Um, do you want to tr trust hunks of data? This is getting to be. Um, more interesting as we start having things like uh, Intel's SGX, where the data that you're putting into um, what they call an enclave is a program, but you might want to actually ha say things about what circumstances you want to be in force when you allow people, to, when, when you allow a program to do that. And then there are just basic resources like the clock. Yeah, it's like, do I want to protect the clock? Uh, there are some cases where the, the current permissions on the clock just aren't adequate. So you might want to, to do things on resources or other system resources, memory, uh, memory pages, uh, things like that. And then what do you want to protect it from? Yeah, this, is, this is kind of an a interesting point because you might say, I want ultimate file security. And it's like, OK, we'll put ultimate file security in place. But what are you, who are you protecting it from? Uh, well, do you, you want to protect it from people? Because we got people out there who are malicious. And we got people out there that are stupid. Uh, and there are people who are poor, uh, sorry, poorly trained. Um, uh, or the other thing we're seeing these days, and yeah, believe me, from what, when I started out in the, in the computer industry, we never even thought about this, not until Mr. Morris put his worm out, uh, which is that applications themselves can be written to be malicious. It's like they just, it, it's not some person doing this. There's nobody sitting out there driving this, but this bit of code, regardless of where it came from, is going to do bad things to your system. And we also have, believe it or not, one or two applications out there in the environment today that are badly written. Um, I won't say Node.js, but uh, many, some of the things that are included in there are actually not especially well done. 
And this isn't news, I wouldn't, wouldn't think. It's like Sturgeon's Law says that 90% of everything is crap. Um, and that applies to software just as well as it applies to, to trashy novels. Yeah. Uh, the other thing you might want to think about is network access. What is networking and the, the behavior of packets coming in and going out of your system mean for the things you want to protect? Uh, the nice thing about network packets is that they don't have any attribute information associated with them usually. So you don't know who they came from or who they're going to. They're just blobby things. So how, are we gonna, how do you want to protect against that, or do you? Um, so given that, now I'm going to shift gears. And this will happen throughout the, throughout the talk, because um, I, my coherency editor was, was off this week. Um, and that is, well, We've got, okay, we've got, we, we know we want to protect, some, we, we know what we want to protect, we know what we want to protect it from. What do we have to do to, what, how, how do we actually go about do that? Well, we have two elements that we use for, for protecting things. Um, hooks and blobs. Uh, a hook is, is the piece of, piece of, bits of code that, we, that you implement for a particular, when, when, when you get to a particular place in the kernel and it's going around doing some, usually access control checks for other things, but sometimes not, um, we'll call a security hook. And this is a bit of code that will take some, some set of information and then make a decision in addition to what the rest of the kernel is doing and say, yeah, you can do this or no, you can't. And they're sprinkled about the, the system in, in a, well thought out in structured way. Um, so my example here is with inode permission. If you want to check and see whether a process has access to a particular inode, it calls security inode permission. And because you have an L, a security module registered in here, which we'll call sample, your, your, the sample LSM, it will call sample inode permission, which will then look at the security blob which in this case is, is I know I security and say you, then your security module will use that information combined with the fact that it's that hook and say, I'm gonna make this um, decision this way, yes or no. Uh, you can also use any of the other I know information, by the way, in this case, uh, you could use that user IDs, group IDs, anything else that's in the I know to decide whether to make the access control check as well. But this is the basic model here is you've got a hook, which is your bit of code. Um, you've got the security blob, which is the information that you're maintaining about that. Uh, and again, you can put just about anything you want in there. So the first kind of hooks that are really important are access control hooks. These are the hooks where you actually make decisions. Um, generally, these are passed as has relevant security pointers, which will have blobs hung off, hung off of them. Uh, usually they're in the current context, not, of course, always, because that would be too easy. Um, use any needed. Okay, so you don't have to have, okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Stephen's laughing at me, and that's, that's just fine. Um, usually, well, okay, so you don't have to use all the LSM hooks. You only have to supply those that actually are relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. So if you're not looking at file system objects, if you're only looking at network packets, for example, you don't have to use any of the, any of the inode hooks. If you're only looking at file system objects, you don't have to use any of the networking hooks. If you're only looking at system five IPC, you don't need networking hooks or inode hooks, you just need the ones that are relative to system five IPC. So you just need the hooks that you actually need. You don't need to supply any of the others. The system is, is just fine if you have a limited number. Um, and then they return the access decision. So if you decide that, um, well, if, if, for example, your hook needs to allocate memory for some reason and it fails, you, you return, re, returns to that. 
Um, or you might, re might say, yes, I like this, return e-access. I don't like it, return access. Yes, I do return zero. So the hooks are bail on fail, which means that if you have a, a list of hooks, and they're, they are, they're kept in, in a list, uh, the first error that's encountered is returned. So just as the, the discretionary access control, you know, the, the normal DAC checks are made first, if they fail, then you, you never get called because it's already known that access is gonna be denied. If there's another security module ahead of you that's actually also making a check on that and it fails, you don't get called. But if everybody else ahead of you gets you know, succeeds, then you get called, you say, yay, it's my turn. And then you can, can say, I approve of this action or I don't. And everybody's happy there. And then it goes on to the next one, if there is a next one. Um, so you have to be careful with the state engine because you have to realize that it's entirely possible that you won't get called even though you're at the point. You know, I know permission gets called. Your security module may never, may never get called because something may, may be denied ahead of you in the list. So it's just a matter of state engines need to be aware of that. We also have state maintenance hooks. Um, and these are used to keep the security blobs and other securities and other state consistent. So for example, when a file is out is uh, opened the first time an inode is allocated, a hook is called so that the security, the security module can allocate its blob or initialize it in the, the modern case. Uh, sometimes uh, call, calls are made where, ah. for example, if um, you exec a program, you're gonna have to change the credential or you may have to change the credential in which case you need to maintain, you know, do some maintenance on, on the credential. Um, also, when an inode goes away, you need to tear down or, or free the information that's available there. Um, and we also have hooks for mapping between set contexts, sec security contexts and security IDs, which I'll talk about in a later slide, which is in the wrong order. All right, so access control hooks can return values. In general, these are the only four values that they should, should return. There are exceptions, um, but on the whole, they should either return zero if, they, if they're happy and, every, and they want to allow the access. Uh, Enom uh, is kind of one of those banes of the C runtime environment where you have to allocate memory explicitly and you can't be guaranteed that it will succeed. Uh, E-access says no, you, I don't want you to do this. And EPERM uh, is you needed to have privilege to do this and you didn't. Uh, people often get EXS and EPERM confused, um, but, the real, but it, it's actually pretty simple. It's like it, it, I am denying you access based on my policy. Uh, EPERM is no one should be able to do that. Why did you ask to do that? Oh, and you didn't have CAPSIS admin. Okay, that's, that's the distinction there. Uh, okay. Security blobs. Let's talk some about security blobs. Uh, a security blob is just a chunk of information. Um, the, the kernel outside of your security module doesn't care about what's in the blob. You care about what's in the blob. You can put anything you, essentially anything you want in, in a blob. So they're referenced by kernel data structures. So for, okay, so, um, and that's on the next slide. Uh, they're managed by the infrastructure mostly. Um, not all of them are managed by the infrastructure, but we're getting pretty close to that. Um, and so what that means is the infrastructure will allocate it, tell you where it is, and you can then uh, manipulate it as, as you like. Uh, but there are a few cases where the modules are actually required to maintain, to, to do the allocation and freeing of these explicitly. Uh, we're in, in a transition state where we used to do it all where the modules did all the allocation of blobs, but now we're making it so the infrastructure does it so you can have more than one module at a time. Uh, as of 5.3, um, the infrastructure man, managed ones are uh, 
actually most of them. And the ones that are module managed are ones that we haven't actually hit a conflict on yet, but we will be soon. Um, most of what you'll be doing with most security modules are on the, the uh, infrastructure managed ones. So you should, be, you should actually be pretty happy there. Um, okay, and as I said, yeah, they're, the infrastructure managed blobs, are, they're allocated and freed by the infrastructure, so you don't have to worry about it. If you have a linked list inside your security blob, yeah, you're going to have to manage that yourself. Um, when you set up your security module and you register it with the system, you're going to tell it how much space you need for each of your blobs. Um, and then when you register, it's going to tell you where the offset is in, in the blob. So that's a little bit of detail. So a little bit of detail on that. When you want to, uh, and we said we were going to tell you how to write a uh, security module here. We're not going to hit every detail, but we're going to hit, hit some of them pretty, pretty hard. Um, so module details. When you want to define an LSM, um, you have to tell it a few things. You have to tell it its tell 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 it its tell everybody its name. Um, here we're calling it sample. Um, you have to tell it where your blob sizes are, and so we have a structure for that. And you have to say the name of the function that you're going to use to initialize it. This is so you can all, can register it all. Uh, the flags. Uh, in a lot of cases, you won't need any of them, but uh, the two flags we have are legacy major, uh, which means that on the boot line, if you say security equals this security module, you'll get that one and none of the other legacy, ma legacy ma major modules. And if you say exclusive, that means that you're using security blobs that are not um, infrastructure managed. And so you can't run two of those at once. So only the first one of those that's registered is going to get, act, get used. As we go further into this, this stacking uh, notion, that becomes less important. But for now, that's how you make sure that you don't conflict with anybody. So when you want to set the blob sizes, um, we have a structure here. It's called, believe it or not, LSM blob sizes. And you tell it for each of the blobs you use how much space you want. And then when you register your module, it will keep track of all the modules that are allocating blobs and say, all right, you get this, this much. And then it refills this structure with the offsets. So you say, I want 45, 45 bytes. Bad number. I want 48 bytes. And at the end of registration, it'll put in here the offset of your 48 bytes in the, in what's in the blob that's off of uh, that particular uh, kernel data structure. Often this will be zero, which is great because that means you're, you're the only one there probably. So we're going to talk <clears throat> a little bit now about the blob, the sec ID, and the sec context. Again, we're, we're hitting, hitting the detail here. I didn't promise coherency. Um, with the blob, the security blob is just this chunk of data that you've got. Um, so conceptually, you should be able to access that. You should be able to, to reference it. Um, so we have two ways to reference it. The first one is the sec context. Okay, the context is actually a name, a character string that you, your module uses to reference that particular set of data. Okay. Now the sec ID is a 32-bit number which references the same data. But that's kept completely inside the kernel. That is never exported. Um, there's one per sec context and they're volatile. So you don't put that out on a disk and reboot the system and expect that to be meaningful. Uh, if you're going to actually so yeah, the sec context is the thing that is actually the data. Um, and then the blob itself can have whatever you want, linked lists off, off into inode tables, whatever. OK. So the lifecycle management of the sec context is, is kind of important because these are strings. Um, they show up in audit, audit records, probably the best example for them. Um, when you send one out, when, when 
if you have a, uh, a sec context to sec ID or a sec ID to, to sec context or in, any of the LSM hooks that generates a sec context, um, that puts a string out into the rest of the kernel code so it can use it. So the audit system, for example, says, oh, uh, I have a sec ID which I got from the inode of something, so I've got that, now I'm going to convert it to a string so I can print it out. And then when I've got that, well, what do I do with it? Well, then I release it. Um, and you do have to do a release because the different LSMs treat the allocation of these things differently. SC Linux, for example, will always generate a new text string and pass you a pointer to it uh, in, a, in for a sec context. Smack always has all of its label names in memory, so it doesn't do that. It simply returns you the pointer to it and says, here, here's, this, here's the string you're going to use. So you, it, when you release an SC Linux context, it does a k-free. When you release a Smack context, it says, yep, did that, because there's nothing to release. Um, so it's important that callers, and that, to note that callers will always use security release context, or they, uh, people who try to do it otherwise get harangued rather nastily by people like me, because then LSMs start breaking. So process attributes. Processes have attributes. Everybody figured that one out? OK, good. Um, most important process attributes are credentials. Now, a credential is a shared thing. So a number of processes, a number of tasks, will actually point to the same credential. Uh, this is done for a number of reasons. Uh, they're copy on write, so if, you, if the user ID changes on a process, then the, you're just going to get a new credential. Um, if the smack label changes, it's going to get a new credential. If the SC Linux context changes, it's going to get a new credential. So there's quite a bit of, uh, you can see, quite a, quite a number of things you have to do here to, to manage a credential. But it's actually fairly straightforward. You just have to realize that it's not that every process has its own credential. Uh, this is where um, the cred security is actually where the information that you're going to add to your LSM is going to, going to live. That's where your security blob is going to be. And current cred security is actually used in a lot of cases because a lot of these, again, a lot of the hooks are done in the current context. Um, the important thing here is that a, a cred credential, uh, the cred blob has to be prepared when it gets duplicated, um, has to be set out. Set when, it, set when it's um, when it's duplicated, and that happens in places other than within your LSM. That happens in a bunch of places. Uh, so a task, we also have um, a security blob on tasks, which are different from credentials in that they are actually actually information about this task, and so you're not sharing that. So you can have two tasks with the same credential; they'll have different. They'll have the same credential blob. They will have different task blobs. Right. And again, th these are both infrastructure man managed uh, credential uh, blobs, so you don't have to allocate them or deallocate them. OK, so if you want to see any of these things, okay, if you're outside the kernel and you say, I would like very much to know what my credential blob, what my security context of my process is, we actually have um, interfaces in proc, ad, in, in slash proc, um, the adder subdirectory, or the adder sub subdirectory, uh, actually contains information about your process. Um, current is used by SC Linux, AppArmor, and Smack today, um, and it will tell you one of the three which of the three depends on which one is actually first in the stack. Um, and that's kind of, a, kind of a problem. So moving forward, um, we have a mechanism where we're adding subdirectories in Adder. So Smack is the first adopter on that. Um, AppArmor is actually moving away from slash proc to sysfs. Sys, sys, sys is that correct? 
No, okay. So he, he'll tell you about whether you're moving away from. Okay, they're doing a subdirectory too. Okay, so um, ha, if, if you're writing an LSM, the important message here is if you're writing an LSM, use a subdirectory. Um, the mechanism, oh, I see a question, yay! Okay, we, we can now have a best question by definition. Okay, so the question is, is proc adder only used by LSMs? And I believe it is. Um, and if you want to write a new LSM to pre present something new in uh, proc adder, that would be something you could do, although there's nothing to restrict it to that. Uh, you could use that for, for other mechanisms, you know, for other things. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, one of the important things is they're only writable if the, if the, the process ID, the, the PID there, is self. So you can, under some circumstances, write to these files and change your process attributes, uh, provided the LSM involved ha allows you to do that. But you can't write to anybody else's process using this mechanism. You can, however, read the information for other processes, provided the Security modules allow that, okay. And important, again, yeah, you, these are defined in procfs, you can add them, add them, add them there, and use a subdirectory because nobody wants to be confused when they read current. Was there a question? Current, yeah, proc self adder current, yeah, okay, um, if you, if you're on a SMAC system, you'll get one value. If you're on a SE Linux system, you'll get the SE Linux value. AppArmor system, you'll get the AppArmor value. And um, your, if your user space code doesn't know which it is, it could get very confused. So now we're gonna talk about some of the uh, object-based or, yeah, you know, object-based hooks, right, okay. So, Object-based hooks, they're affiliated with kernel objects. Now, how many of you are familiar with subject-object models? Is there anybody who isn't? Oh, good, 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 education time. Okay. Um, so a kernel object, uh, in a subject-object model, you have subjects, which are the active entities, and objects, which are the passive entities. So um, the objects we're talking about here are the passive entities, and the definitions are uh, very dependent on who you, of what qu qu quantifies, what qualifies as an object varies depending on who you talk to. Um, but there, but so object hooks are based, affiliated with kernel objects, things like files, IPC objects. Um, access is based on attributes that are attached to the objects. So if you want to access a file, it, information off of the inode. If you want to access something that's file descriptor based, you want to do it off the file structure. If it's an IPC object, it's the IPC perm structure. So it's all about things that are hooked up, hooked up to the object, attributes of the object. Um, and the, the downside on this is these things can be hard to, for humans to identify. If, for example, you have a file Somebody opens it, it gets unlinked. What's the name of it? Uh, the name is actually the inode number, which is still there, and the device it's on, uh, which is yeah, the true name, but it, that does, that's not real helpful for most people. Most people say, I just wanna know what the file name was on it, but um, you don't have that because you're just dealing with the, the real object down at the bottom, which again, doesn't have the name. So object attributes, inf again, information about things. Uh, for an inode, um, you have the file system object information. You have the, inf okay, and that's, again, this, the blob is infrastructure managed, so if you're writing a module, you don't have to allocate that. It'll get allocated for you. Uh, we have traditional attributes like user IDs. Um, and you have extended attributes, which are attributes that you've decided to add um, things like smack labels, SC Linux contexts, all kinds of things that you can add. You can add essentially anything you want with an extended attribute, which we'll get to in just a second. 
We also have a file structure. Um, and these are also, um, this is information again, it's relative to the file descriptor rather than, than to the inode. Um, it includes the uh, an inode pointer, thank heavens. Um, again, it's infrastructure managed, um, and you can get at the traditional attributes and the extended attributes as well. So you can actually use this, you also get a little bit more information about the uh, open state of the file. So you can use that there. Use that there. Uh, so traditional file security attributes, again, you can use these um, at will. So you can use the user IDs, you can use the access modes, you can use the file types. You can say, yeah, I don't want people to be able to read symlinks, I hate symlinks. Uh, you can say, oh, look, this file has, has uh, a link count of more than two. Well, that means it's, on, it's dangerous, so I'm not gonna allow, allow anybody, to, anybody to use it. Uh, one of the more interesting aspects here are locks. Locks are hard. Yeah, if, if you want to write an LSM that, does, that, that deals with um, file system locking, um, I would recommend that you think really hard about it because locks have different semantics as far as accessibility than just about anything else. You can set a read lock on a file you don't have access, have write access to. That's always fun. Okay. And the other thing is, <coughs> yeah, don't overload the attributes. Don't say, um, my LSM, user IDs are going to be used to describe um, the time-based access control. I'm not gonna use them to differentiate users anymore. Uh, there's a, a famous system did that, and then they said, well, we're a single user system, so we're just going to co-opt the user IDs and use them for, for other purposes. And then somebody said, hey, this is a great device, we love it, can we please have multiple users on them? And the developers went, huh, because that meant they had to implement profiles on top of their system instead of having multiple users. Um, that's a bad, a bad, bad idea there. Uh, there was also another, uh, back in the Unix days, there was a system that implemented mandatory access control by stealing the groups. Nobody uses groups, so we're gonna make the group be the, the mandatory access control label. That was good fun. They changed the semantics of groups and it, and it led to tears. So extended attributes. Okay. We, have two, <laughs> we have four kinds of extended attributes on Linux. How many people knew that? Four, but there are four. Okay, how many people knew that we actually only use two? Okay, good. Um, we have user attributes, which anybody can add to their files, and the system doesn't care about these. It's just a, a bit of information you can put on. The original purpose of these was actually what kind of icon you would display when the, when the, the GUI was, was running and you wanted to, to do an LS equivalent. Oh, look, I can put, put the little, little GIF out there. It shows me what kind of file it is. Um, there's the security attributes. Okay, the security attributes are actually used by the LSMs and actually supported throughout the system. These are only used by the, by the LSMs, by the way. So you set the, the LSM is in complete control of who can access these and under what circumstances. Uh, we have system, we also have system attributes and trusted attributes, neither of which are used. Uh, but it seemed a good idea at the time when the system was, when the extended attribute system was being put in. Uh, so they're maintained by file systems. Not all file systems support them. Not all file systems support them the same way. Some file systems have severe limitations on them. Others, uh, you can have as secure, you can have attributes that are as big as the file. Um, it's a matter, again, it, it's an implementation detail. Most file systems, most reasonable file systems, these days, support them. And if you want your LSM to deal with file systems that don't support extended attributes, that's up to you. So system five IPC objects and keys, we're just gonna talk about these just ever so briefly. Um, what they have, 
they have their own namespace for the objects. When you allocate one of these things, um, it creates its own internal data. They actually have uh, security blobs associated with them as well. You can actually do whatever policy you want you want on these. Um, they're not again. They're not file system namespace, so you can't use the file system semantics on them. No inodes, um, but we do have blobs on those. It's just another area where you have. To you have to do special work to make them work. So at this point, I'm going to invo in, in, invoke my very first guest speaker. Uh, we're going to have John Johansson, who is the App Armor maintainer. He's going to talk about path hooks because path-based hooks are really interesting, and he's the only one who knows how they work. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the path-based hooks, um, there's, a, there's a config that you have to enable in the kernel to use them. Uh, they're not there by default with just security uh, LSM hooks. Uh, this is the list of hooks. Um, they're not sufficient. If you're going to use them, there's, there's cases you can use them in for sure, and, and you'll get the information from them. but they are not sufficient in of themselves. You're going to have to be doing uh, other stuff in the LSM. They don't mediate every file access. It's, it's at the sys, more at the syscall level, uh, not exactly syscall, but there is kernel accesses that will access files uh, that bypass them. They don't, they don't pick those up. Um, they don't mediate open files. Uh, so you're going to have to use some of the other hooks. Uh, some of those are like there's, there's file hooks. Uh, there's inode hooks, uh, mount hooks are really important when you're talking about file system path accesses because mounts can uh, make aliases, right? So what do you get with a path, the path hooks? Basically, you're going to get a struct path. You don't get the file name directly. Um, and the, the file names, even if you do get a file name, which you don't, they're not unique to the system, right? Um, they're not a per object thing. They can be alias, depending on namespacing and everything else in there. Uh, so what you do is you're going to use uh, some kernel mechanism. Kernel provides a couple. Dentry path does a reverse walk up to the mount, uh, sort of. So it's just it's just on the, within the the device, right? So you're just walking up a little bit. You're not going to find the full path that's in the system at the namespace. And the D path does a reverse walk all the way up to the root of your your namespace. So you can reconstruct these paths that that are passed into the kernel. So what happens with, like I said, these security hooks, the, the path hooks are at this kind of the syscall level, but it's after it's done the lookup, right? So the kernel has already walked and found the object, and now we have the VFS mount and the dent tree um, for that object, and now we're going to walk back and, and reconstruct a path. And it may actually not be the same path that the the lookup the, the, the syscall used to get to this object. Um, because uh, you can, like I said, you can have multiple paths to an object, but also because you're, the, the reverse lookup is going to take out to symlinks. So if you had a symlink in that path walk that the syscall did, the reverse lookup doesn't see that symlink. Um, so those are things to consider with this. Um, the, Doing these D path calls, uh, it has locking on it. Um, so there's, there's performance considerations. Um, everywhere you have a security path hook, you can, you can, you can do these. You can, the locking is okay to do that, but it is something to consider, so you, you, you might want to cache when you're using them. And you also need a big buffer to look up the path name, right? Um, if you have the Dentry VSF mount, that's small, but the path, you don't know how long it's going to be, and path names can be really huge. Um, and so you might be allocating a buffer every time you go in these. Ideally, is what you want to do is you actually want some buffer that you have a, a working buffer that you don't have, you can reuse, you don't have to reallocate it all the time. Um, so aliases really are the big problem with using the, the path hooks. 
Uh, you have sim links, you have hard links, you have mounts to roots and namespaces. All of them make aliases. Um, and so when you are looking at these, you really have to think hard about your model and what you're trying to achieve. Now, that doesn't, say, that doesn't mean you can't use these, but you really have to think hard about it. Uh, and I would caution you that you, know, you have to take these into consideration, all of these, and some of these are really hard problems. Um, sim links are actually the easiest because like I said, uh, the path hooks actually, the, the kernel lookup resolves that first and then you don't actually see the sim link, uh, not on the reverse walk anyways. Um, so you don't have to worry about the alias the sim link is taking there as long as you're treating it as a separate object. So you treat it as two objects, you sim link, sim link objects, so you'll, you'll mediate a sim link creation of the sim link, maybe what's put, being put in the sim, li sim link. There is a hook to uh, mediate walking or following sim links. Uh, you don't get the full path, you're just gonna get an inode entry with that, but you can do some stuff with that as long as you're working with multiple hook types. Um, and then you have the target, and what you're really doing is you're mediating, if you're doing dpath, you're mediating post sim link resolution. Um, Hard links, these are a lot harder. Um, they are permanent alias, right? They're, they're stored on the file system. You need to really think about these. Now you can find that you have a link count on these. Uh, you know, I've got a link count of two, so I know that this is a hard linked file, but the system doesn't store what, what the aliases are in the, the link. Now it's potentially possible you could do that yourself um, in your security X or attribute or something. Um, you have to figure this out. Um, you also have to figure out what your threat model is here because with hard links, because they're a permanent alias, you know, are you only worrying about something being an online attack? So I could prevent the hard links from being created um, or am I worried also about somebody coming along offline attack and changing the file system and adding hard links and then a, that alias is there and I, I don't, can't deal with it, right? Um, when you're, when you're dealing with these aliases, you have to think about, if I create this link, this alias, and if I'm mediating based on these, does, you know, does it create the, does it expand the permission set for this task? Oh, or also, potentially, does it expand it for any other task or any other part of the system? And that's where the alias is re really dangerous. Um, and you have to come up with a way to deal with this in your model, and, or at the very least, say that this really doesn't matter to my model. You have to, you have to think about it. Um, mounts, they have basically all the same issues as hard links, except for they're runtime only. Um, they're not gonna be stored well. I mean, you, you have your mount tabs and stuff, but it's not a, an object in the system type thing that, where it's stored. Um, and you can, again, those mounts are made every time you boot up, so you, if you're in there from the start, you can do things, mediate mounts to, uh, to help mitigate aliases. And you really do want to be mediating mounts if you're looking at the path names and doing any kind of mediation based off of them. Um, cheroots, turns out cheroots can be bad depending on how you want to use them, but the system does provide a, a D absolute path, which is a variant of D path and it will walk past the cheroot back up to the actual namespace root. Um, so it is one way you can deal with cheroots without having to put in any extra, a whole bunch of effort to deal with aliases. The real killer though is mount namespaces. Um, there is no mount hierarchy with mount namespaces. There's, there's, they're just flat, they can be anywhere, they can be disassociated from each other, they can share. Uh, there is no ma mapping. You're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna deal with these or how it applies to your model. Um, different objects in the same, for the same paths at, you know, same location. Um, and then you have the issue where you, you will get files, you will get requests, not in the path hook itself, but when you're trying to deal with stuff at the path level, coming through the file hooks, if you're working with the file hooks, because you're working with those in conjunction with the path hooks, where these objects don't exist in your mount namespace. Um, and so you have to know how you're gonna deal with those. Uh, you can figure out whether uh, an object is in your mount namespace by using another call called rmount, 
Um, and then you're going to have to figure out from there what you're going to do for these objects that aren't in your, your path mediations. Um, things like delegation models would work. All right, Paul. at this fancy little clicker, which means I'm going to screw something up, so patience, please. Um, anyway, so the networking access hooks. There's basically uh, two levels of hooks. Uh, the one first one, the easiest one to use, is the socket level hooks. Uh, these map very well to the socket-related system calls. You know, we have hooks for you know, doing a bind operation, doing a connect, um, listening. Pretty much every, every major socket syscall has a socket level hook. And this is a good way if you want your LSM to be able to control accesses between the processes and the sockets themselves. Uh, because keep in mind, you can have a socket sh that's shared. So it's not always going to be guaranteed to be exclusive to your application. The next type of networking access control hooks are what, what I call the packet level hooks, um, or the per packet hooks. Uh, these are low level controls that actually take place on the network traffic itself. Um, very low level. Um, these allow you to do a number of things. Um, these allow you to control access between the, um, the network interfaces in the packet, the sockets in the packet. Uh, if you want to look at the IP addresses, you can do that. Pretty much anything that's in the packet itself is fair game. Um, so there's a number of things. You know, in, in SE Linux, for example, we, you know, we can compare against the incoming network interface. Uh, this is where we do all our label networking controls and whatnot. So there's a good deal of flexibility here. Um, although we've heard locking challenges come up a few times, there are definitely some locking challenges that you need to be aware of, uh, both on the inbound and the outbound side, because you are getting called from the networking stack, and the networking folks have gone to a lot of effort to make the networking stack extremely performant. So you need to be careful not to completely mess things up. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I, the other big thing, you know, we've talked about there's hooks and then there's labels. Um, so network labels, we, I'm not, I'm pretty confident when I say that networking is a little special in the case that we actually allow you to have multiple labels for a single packet, um, which can be challenging sometimes to get your head around and is maybe not the best thing to do, but it's what we've got. So one of the first ones is the SecMark label. Um, sometimes you might hear somebody talk about the NetFilter label, but we pretty much call it the SecMark label these days. Um, these are packet labels that are actually set based on your NetFilter configuration. So you write an IP tables command line, and you can use that to set a SecMark label on your traffic. And you can set this for incoming traffic, outgoing traffic, forwarded traffic, uh, basically, anything that you can write in an IP tables command is fair game. Uh, so the one thing to keep in mind, I um, said this before, this is for the local configuration, right? So this doesn't give you any real information from the remote node, other than what might be available in the, in the packet or the stream itself, you know, like the, the source address and the source port but you'd have no real way of getting any information about the security attributes of the remote system. Like, you're not necessarily going to be able to determine, you know, what was the process running at, what was the label associated with the process on the remote host with the SecMark labels. Um, but anyway, one, one kind of easy, quick way to think of the SecMark labels is if you're familiar with SC Linux, and uh, AppArmor might support context mounting, same with Mac, I apologize, I don't know, but if you're familiar with the idea of a context mount, which is where you can basically mount a file system and say, okay, everything on this file system, treat it with this particular labels, that's kind of, at a very high level, that's a fairly good analogy for the SecMark labels, if that helps you think of it. Uh, the next one is NetLabel. Um, NetLabel isn't one particular labeling protocol or, or packet label. It, it's kind of a bit of a framework. Um, it supports two of the standardized labeling protocols, explicit labeling protocols. We've got CIPSO for IPv4, and we've got CLIPSO for IPv6. 
Uh, we also support kind of a, a static fallback labeling mechanism, which allows you to treat unlabeled hosts or unlabeled networks the same way you might treat a Cypso or a Calypso host. Basically allows you to say, okay, if I get network traffic from this particular host over this particular interface, um, go ahead and treat it as if it came in as a labeled host. So it's great if you need to talk to things like, you know, an unlabeled DNS server. Um, if you have, you know, Windows or Mac clients you want to talk to. Um, it's a nice way to do that and, you know, have everything on your, all of the network traffic coming into your system, you know, it'll look to your LSM as if it's labeled. So it's a nice little fallback. The one kind of got you to be aware of, all of the on-the-wire protocols, so Cypso and Calypso, they only support MLS attributes. So this is, you know, a, a sensitivity level, you know, top secret, secret, and then a compartment or a category bitmap. So there's no standardized provision for doing more than that. Um, we do have for local traffic, so things that go over loopback, we do have some kind of clever cheats, if you will, where we can actually send the full LSM label, but once again, that only works for loopback. Um, we actually kind of intentionally break the format so that it won't pass checksum verification if you send it off the box so that um, kind of as an extra protection to prevent you from doing that. So once again, keep that in mind. The other thing we have is labeled IPsec. Um, similar to NetLabel, this is an on-the-wire format for communicating security labels over the network. Uh, it's currently SELINK specific, um, but the good news is where I said that, you know, Cypso and Calypso can only send MLS information. Labeled IPsec can send arbitrary labels. It's, it's basically you're just passing a string back and forth. Um, there has been some effort to standardize this at the IETF. There was an effort many years ago which kind of petered out, and I just saw something recently. It's being, there's another renewed effort. Um, I'm not part of this renewed effort, so I don't know all the gory details, but there is some effort going on there. Um, some of what I'm going to tell you now is a little subjective based on my experience, so take this with a grain of salt. But um, having spent several years on this, I, I would say there's a little bit of experience behind these subjective comments. Uh, IPsec granularity is typically a very poor fit for LSMs. Um, and if you want, I, I don't want to take up the rest of our time talking about that, but if you're familiar with IPsec and how the selectors work and how the LSMs work typically with the access controls, it, it's just not a good fit. And it leads to some problems I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, however, it's hard to ignore the, the encryption and the integrity checking and the authentication that comes with IPsec. It's a very nice thing to have. Um, and it works in a lot of scenarios. So, it, you know, if you want that benefit, I would encourage you to look at some of the other things like Cypso and Calypso and running that over a standard IPsec tunnel or, you know, transport, depending on the protocol and what your needs are. Um, that's a much more standard approach. It works a lot better, and it gives you many of the same advantages that you would get with labeled IPsec. The only real thing you lose is you don't have an arbitrary string. But in some ways, if you're talking over the network to a remote host, that might actually be good. MLS is a much more standardized label format. There's, it's not an arbitrary string that could be misinterpreted. Okay, and so now we'll get off network labeling and we'll, we'll go back to the local system. Um, SO PeerSec and IP PassSec. These are socket options that allow you to get these network label information up into your application uh, because there will be times when you might want to have a network daemon, some sort of service on the system that is label aware and that you want to understand, okay, what, who am I talking to on the other end of this, this connection? Um, nice part about it is these are normal socket options. Um, with LibSE Linux, we do provide an API for getting this information so you don't have to do the, the set sock op, get sock op sort of thing. Um, but you can roll your own. Um, you know, these are standard Linux socket options. There's nothing special. Um, it does obviously require that you have that labeling information in the kernel for the connection in the first place. So you are going to use, have to use either NetLabel with one of those different 
protocols or the fallback or labeled IPsec to get that information. Um, otherwise, there's no label to give you. Um, the one, the one positive of that is if you're on the local system and you're using, you know, AF local or AF Unix sockets, you can have that information automatically because it's easy for us in the kernel to go look at the other end and see, okay, this is who you're talking to. So now I just want to touch a few more slides on just some, I guess, lessons learned or hidden dangers to, to watch out for um, if you're playing around with LSMs and want to do your own thing. Um, probably the biggest thing that we see, or that I've seen people try to do, um, is try to reject connections on the accept hook. And accept is way too late. Uh, by the time a connection gets into the sockets, you know, connection queue, so that you can pull it off with accept, basically you've already finished the handshake with the remote node and you've said that, yep, we can talk, life is good and you're basically just waiting for the application to come along and say, yeah, I'm ready to start talking to you. I'm gonna pull this connection out of the queue and, and get going. The best you can safely do, unless you wanna be a really bad neighbor, you know, I mean, you could reject it, but it's kind of equivalent of, you know, somebody knocks on your door, you let them inside, close the door behind them, and then throw them out the window. Um, so that, that's kind of the equivalent. So, you, but what you can do is you can, in the accept level hook, basically say that I don't want to allow this application to pull that connection off the incoming connection queue, which that's perfectly valid. The connection still stays there and presumably at some point, depending on the underlying protocols, it would time out, I would imagine. But anyway, um, if you want to reject incoming connections during the handshake process, use the packet level access controls. There are hooks specifically for that. When you get an incoming connection, you can drop it. It's safely, it's the equivalent of you basically never opening the door to your house. So um, that's the polite way to go about doing it. Uh, the other thing, uh, struct SK buff. Um, <laughs> we have no security blob in the packets themselves. And for a long, <laughs> there's, there's a huge history as to why this is. Um, and I'm just gonna say that it's unlikely that we'll ever get one. Um, there is, there's potentially ways we might be able to fake it. Um, and if you're really interested in doing that work, come talk to me. Um, but I, if you're writing your own LSM, you're gonna have enough challenges in the beginning. Don't, don't take this one on. Um, once again, a little subjective comment, but uh, I've got a lot of battle scars to, to scare you off on this one. Um, I guess the one exception is SecMark does have a 32-bit field in the SK buff. Um, if it was 64-bit, this would be a totally different slide, but it's not. Um, so you do have that, and this is one of the, this kind of gets to this point of why we have two labels on a packet, because um, the SecMark is kind of separate from everything else. Um, to get around this, NetLabel has some kind of clever workarounds uh, because NetLabel uses explicit packet labeling protocols for the most part. Um, we actually treat the IP option headers as our security blob. Uh, we just go in and look at the option header and recalculate the label each time you ask for it. So if you're looking at NetLabel, there's a caching mechanism in there. Strongly suggest you use that because that will help get rid of a lot of the overhead of having to go back into the option header and convert the uh, label format for you. Uh, labeled IPsec works around this because it uses the security associations themselves for the labeling information. Um, it's very convenient in this case, but it's also one of the reasons why labeled IPsec is kind of a poor fit for a lot of LSM um, security models. So anyway, stuff to keep in mind. Um, and one of the last few slides, actually, sorry, the last slide for the networking stuff uh, is the labeling protocols themselves. Um, CIPSO uses IPv4 options, and I don't know how familiar most of you are with IPv4, but the IPv4 options is, with, looking back at it, I mean, I think, what, IPv4 is 40-some years old, um, probably made great sense at the time, but nowadays it's perhaps not the best way to do optional information, um, and 
a lot of network infrastructure will go ahead and eat IPv4 options. However, in the sense of CIPSO, this is probably not a bad thing. It might actually end up protecting you from yourself because the IPv4 options are not, in the sense of CIPSO anyway, they're not protected by any sort of cryptography or any sort of you know, integrity ch verification checks. So if you're not certain about your network infrastructure and if it's going to be stripping off these CIPSO IP options, that's a good indicator that you don't have a secured network infrastructure. So you should really, in that case, if you're using CIPSO, be running it through some sort of you know, secure tunnel, IPsec or whatnot, in which case it's gonna preserve your IP options and life will be fine. Uh, similar thing with Calypso, except because Calypso is IPv6, IPv6 has much better option handling. Uh, Calypso happens to be a hop-by-hop -hop option, if you guys know what that means. Um, but similar thing, if you really want to secure that, throw it inside an IPsec tunnel, life will be much better. Um, labeled IPsec, once again, I don't want to go into too much of the gory details, but uh, labeled IPsec, if you're not careful, can result in a pretty badly exponential explosion of SAs on your system. Uh, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about it using the SAs themselves to contain the labels. So in your normal IPsec configuration, you might have a single tunnel between two nodes. You turn on labeled IPsec, that could easily go into the thousands. And that's just between two nodes. Um, if you're talking between three or four nodes, you can see how it gets out of hand pretty quickly. Uh, it's also not offload friendly. Um, no matter what you do, because the label is in the SA, this means that you need to do Ike between the two systems because that's when the label information actually gets communicated. Um, and if that SA is on the local systems, that means you also need to do your AH or your ESP encapsulation on that system too. So um, there's nothing saying you can't have nested IPsec. You know, if you have some requirement where you need an on the wire, you know, bump on the wire encryptor or whatnot, you can do that, that's fine, but know that you're still gonna have to run IPsec on your host. So. That's it for networking. Um, I can see by the next slide, I'm still up here for audit, but before I jump into that, does anybody have any questions about networking? Okay, crickets, all right. Audit, so audit versus traditional logging. Um, one of the questions we get a lot is why, why do I care about audit? You know, I can do a print K, we've got the, the ring buffer, you know. The basic reason for this is that audit is intended for security relevant events. Uh, these are, you know, access control decisions, configuration changes, I'm trying to think, of it, anything that your LSM could do that could impact the ability for it to enforce, you know, access control decisions on the system. Um, it also happens to record not just that particular inf information, not just, you know, subject, object, verb sort of thing, um, but it also records important, relevant information for that event. You know, for example, if you had a, um, if you're trying to access a file, it's also gonna give you information about, you know, the device, the inode, path name that was used, the current working directory, that sort of stuff. Um, and this was primarily developed for the various security certification efforts that Linux has been put through over the years, um, namely common criteria, but there's others that audit solves as well. And this kind of gets at to the real reason why we don't necessarily want to use, you know, dmessage and print K, is that audit provides us kind of a nice secure path for generating these, you know, these audit records and storing them on the system. Um, if, you know, if you're familiar with, you know, var log audit, the audit daemon, you kind of get an idea of whether you're going there. Um, it also takes care of, you know, managing, you know, and handling backlog overflows, um, you know, exhausting your var log audit partition, um, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of knobs up in the audit daemon and the kernel to handle all that. So, um, once again, probably more information than we can go into today, but um, feel free to get in touch with me. If you have any questions. So what is audit basically? Well, audit is a bunch of records that make up a singular audit event. Um, the number of records for any given event can vary. Um, so for example, I, I mentioned on the past slide, 
you're trying to access a file in the LSM, you know, you're obviously going to have some LSM specific information like the subject and the object labeling, um, as well as, you know, the, the access itself. Uh, but you're also going to get another uh, number of other records. You know, one's going to be a path record, which, like I said, it's going to give you information about the device, the inode, the path name. Um, we'll also give you a syscall record, which will actually give you, you know, okay, what's the what's the syscall that was used to do this? Is it an open? Is it a read? Is it a write? Um, we'll give you the syscall arguments, um, so on and so forth. And there's there's others as well. Um, the good news is that the audit subsystem should handle a lot of this extra work for you. It'll take care of bundling all of these individual records up into a single event. From an LSM perspective, in this case of the file access, um, really all you need to do is to supply your LSM specific information. If auditing is configured and turned on, you'll get that syscall record, you'll get those path records. Um, you know, without you having to do any work. And there's actually even some discussion right now in the case of some of these things, possibly even allowing the LSM to maybe audit some additional information or to indicate to the audit subsystem that you want to have this extra information even if the system's not configured that way. But this is work in progress, so maybe it doesn't happen, we'll have to see. Um, so that last line, audit log format, um, I think the key is for that first argument, instead of sending null, send audit context. That basically is a hint to the audit subsystem to say that, you know, this, this information is associated with the current task and things that it's doing. And that's, that's the clue to the audit subsystem to go ahead and bundle this with the other records. If you leave that as null, the audit subsystem will treat this as a standalone record, a standalone event, and won't necessarily associate it with that syscall and the path record. So from an LSM's perspective, I, I think 99% of the time, you're gonna wanna have that auto context in there. The, the one exception might be for some networking events because you don't necessarily have that. You know, it could be running out of an ISR sort of thing. Um, but there's other problems if you're gonna be auditing on the per packet level hooks. All right, so what to audit? I, I mean, I think we already covered some of this. You know, it primarily comes down to access control decisions. Um, you know, I don't want to make too many assumptions about your LSM, but like I said, I'm going to assume you're going to have a subject, an object, and a verb. Um, you definitely want to record that information. Um, configuration changes, you know, for SE Linux, for example, we have a loadable policy that you can change. So obviously, you know, when you load a new policy, that's something that you want to record in the audit log. Um, yeah, so it's, it's going to be very LSM dependent, I guess, is what I'm getting at, because each LSM is going to have a different, you know, approach to securing the system. But think about if it's, if it's something that you feel is important for the LSM because it's affecting how your LSM operates or how it, you know, affects the system, you probably want to log it. Uh, the other thing is make sure that you're auditing both your success and your failures. You know, because a lot of time if somebody tries to access that file, you want to know if they succeed, you also want to know if they fail because that could be an indication that something not great is going on in the system. You know, it might just be poorly written code or an accident, but it also might be malicious. So logging your failures is just as important as logging your successes. And the final point I'll mention is be careful not to log too much. Uh, you know, people that really care about audit logging that turn on a lot of things and that, you know, run a log aggregator that collects from a whole network of systems, I mean, they can get several gigabytes, if not more, a day of audit logs. And not only does that prevent a storage problem over a long period of time, but also people that are usually, gener people that are usually collecting that much audit information also have heuristics and business analytics that dig through those audit logs looking for certain things. And the bigger that log file is, the harder that becomes. So, um, there is no one right answer here when it comes to, you know, how much to log, but just keep that in your back of your mind. If it doesn't need to be in the audit log, if it's not security relevant, there's plenty of other logging mechanisms out there that you should probably be using. And I think the last slide, then I'll hand you back off to Casey. Um, a few tips that will, you know, keep the audit people happy with what you do. 
Um, don't change the order of fields in a record. That's a quick way to get an immediate knack from me. Um, nothing personal, just the way it is. Um, try to leverage existing field names whenever possible. Uh, you know, audit's been around, it records a number of different things. You know, we already have a subject, an object, and an operation field. Um, go ahead and reuse those. Uh, we also have lsmaudit.c under, you know, the security directory, which is handy for auditing um, various objects on the system. Go ahead and reuse that. You know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, you know, if you're creating your own LSM, once again, you're going to have enough challenges. You're going to be, you know, inventing a lot of new stuff anyway. Feel free to use that stuff, you know, make your life a little bit easier. Um, and the last two things... If you're doing audit changes, you know, if you're using audit in your code, please CC Linux audit on your uh, patch submissions. Um, that helps us help you make sure that you're doing all the right things so that you won't run into any audit problems. It also lets us know that you're doing stuff so that we can make sure that the proper, you know, numbers are reserved in the header files for you. It, uh, it just makes everybody's life easier. Because if we find out after the fact, then there's potentially issues. Um, because once it ends up in Linus's tree and goes out, you can't ever change it, right? So, please CC Linux audit. Um, and finally, write test cases, you know. Um, we're, I'm not going to say that we have a full CI infrastructure, but we do try to test things regularly. And we'll help you make sure that, you know, your auditing continues to work and that if something else happens in the kernel, it won't break your auditing. But we can only do that if you write test cases. Um, so please do that. If you have any questions about that, once again, Linux audit, send mail. We're happy to, uh, to work with you there. So like I said, this is my last slide on audit before I hand you back over to Casey. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody's still awake? OK, all right, thanks. Oh, sorry, we do have one question. So it depends a lot on what you're doing. Um, so for example, in SC Linux, we have the ability to, uh, you know, we look at and we say if there's no labeled networking configuration in the kernel, um, such that basically all we'd be doing is comparing unlabeled to unlabeled, we just don't even bother. We, we, we bail at the top of the hooks because it's all going to be the same comparison. Um, however, if we do have any labeled networking configuration installed, then we go ahead and do the checks because it's not always going to be an unlabeled check. Um, and that seems to work pretty well. Performance is, is pretty minimal. Uh, beyond that, then it's going to depend a lot on what you have the configuration set up as. Like, for example, I mentioned for NetLabel, there's a caching mechanism on there. Um, you know, the first time you see that on the wire label and you have to translate it into the SE Linux label, there is some overhead, but then after that, it's extremely quick um, because it translates it right into SC Linux's SEC ID. Um, so if you're looking at lots of traffic, but it's from one or two long-running streams, um, you know, for example, in the case of an audit aggregator where it's, you know, it opens up the channel and then it just keeps firing events over, the overhead's going to be a lot less than if you've got, you know, if you're bringing up a lot of individual connections, you know, if you've got millions of clients connecting for short-lived things and sending back, the overhead might be a little bit more if they're coming at you with different labels. Um, labeled IPsec, you're already paying a pretty substantial overhead because of all the cryptographic operations. So I, while I haven't done any exact performance measurements on there, my guess is the labeling overhead is noise in that particular case. Um, so yeah, there, there's no hard and fast numbers to give you, but um, it's easy enough to configure your system the way you want it and you know, run NetPerf, run NiPerf over it. Um, it's a pretty easy thing to benchmark. So, sorry for that non-answer. <laughs> yeah. When you say overlap, are you talking like the difference between like Cipso and Calypso versus labeled IPsec, or what, what overlap exactly are you talking about? Uh, 
Oh, so you mean like the, the hooking, basically. Yeah, okay, so a lot of the, and we're rapidly going to get into a really technical discussion here, so I might punt you to let's have this discussion in the hallway. But the, uh, so the socket level hooks, that's an easy one. It happens, you know, in the per socket. That's not all that interesting. Um, most of the per packet stuff um, is either through, net, through a net filter hook um, or through the socket filter hook. So basically the same, you know, BPF is kind of cool and trendy. Um, we kind of hook in the old school way of, you know, where you could actually load a BPF socket filter on there. Um, so we use that same mechanism. That's where the, the receive hook is. So. Last call? All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so, excellent. Uh, thank, thank you both. All right, so we got a few more things to talk about here. So security module interfaces here. So what if you have a security module and you want to be able to dynamically configure it? Uh, you need to have some mechanism to do that. Uh, you might want to tune things. You might want to say, oh yeah, I'm doing a whole lot of controls and I haven't seen a problem in three days, so I'm gonna lower the amount of uh, checking I'm going to do. Or you might want to keep statistics about the number of, kind, number of things that you've denied or number of things you've permitted. So we do have mechanisms for doing that. Um, generally what, we, what we've been using for security modules and what we'd recommend is that you either use security FS or a sysfs uh, special purple files special purpose, not purple, special uh, file system. Um, and you can create these. Uh, they're easy, to, relatively easy to do. Easiest way to go about it, of course, find, go look at an existing one. Um, and that way you can use the file system interface to update your, your configuration, gather your statistics as you would choose. Uh, we want you to avoid using syst adding system calls PR controls, F controls, I octals, because they are difficult to integrate. They consume uh, namespace, uh, yeah, namespace in those, those mechanisms, and they require more application change. One of the things that if you're writing a security module you'll want to be aware of is that people don't change their applications to suit your LSM, usually. Uh, they might do it eventually. Um, you might be able to get things upstream to do that to, to, for that, but in general, people won't change, and they don't. They certainly don't want to change their their programs uh, just to suit your LSM. So, if you use this mechanism, you can do it in scripts, and that's a whole lot easier. Uh, mechanics for SysFS. There are act, actually uh, mechanisms where you can create a new mount point. Uh, register with the file system and do a current mount all automatically so your magic file system shows up without having to do any any work uh, in the configuration of, of the system. And that's always really kind of handy. Um, something you might actually come across, and just about everybody who does an LSM scratches their chin and, and hits this one. It's like, I really want to have a hook here. There is no hook here. I need a new hook here. What do I do? Uh, it's actually not that hard. Um, it's, we add them all the time. You do want to check and see if there's an existing hook that you might be able to put flags on or, or use in a different way, a way that might not have been anticipated earlier. Uh, but generally, it's, it's acceptable to request a new hook. Um, you, in general, you pass the thing, not the thing.security. So if you're doing something on an inode, you pass the inode, not the inode security blob. If you just pass the security blob, then it makes it re really difficult for other LSMs that might be interested in using that hook to use other bits of information. So that's just, and be generic wherever possible. Um, it's really unpleasant when you're reading the, uh, in security.c and you see a hook that is 
specific not only to IPv6, but IPv6 over this kind of device on Tuesday. Uh, so we have a boot line, okay? Let's say you've got your LSM, you wanna put it in, you wanna try, try it out, you, okay? Uh, without making it boot by default so that you can boot your system. So when your LSM fails, you can then boot your system without it. Uh, so we have three important mechanisms here. Security equals, that will one run one of the, le the major legacy um, LSMs plus any of the minor ones. So you'll still get Yama even though you say security equals SE Linux. Uh, if you really want to specify the entire list of security modules that gets used, you can say LSM equals and then give it the list and it will only use those modules. It won't automatically bring in anything else. So uh, be aware of that. And then there's a, a nice little boot option we have lsm.debug which will show you information about how the, mod, how the uh, configuration, the LSM configuration is set up at boot time. So it'll tell you things like how big the blobs are and um, what's registered, um, what modules are registered. Uh, if you have conflicts with uh, legacy modules, it'll tell you which ones are enabled and which ones were disabled and why. So it's about time we did this, about time we had to wrap up. So first thing, have a good reason for doing your LSM. Do something useful. Um, academic exercises are kind of fun, but really we want these things to be valuable. We want to add value to the system. And do this, something the kernel should do. If you can do it up in user space just as easily, go do it there. We don't really need um, Java, Java parsers or XML parsers or any of that kind of stuff down in the kernel. We want to keep it as monolithic and small as we, as we can, we want to keep that under control. So don't do things that you shouldn't do in the kernel, in the kernel. And follow up with user space support and documentation. Um, I know, and, and as Paul mentioned, test suites too. Um, it, it's really annoying when you try to use something and you have to actually go read the code in order to figure out what it's, what it's doing. Don't reinvent the wheel. We have lots of wheels. Um, show us something new. Give us something that'll make us, make us exciting, something that um, Jake will write about in Linux Weekly News. Uh, nobody's done time-based controls. Uh, it's like, and this has been on the table for like 40 years. If I, I could only run this, ex, uh, if I made it so I could only run this program between uh, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. so that it doesn't get abused by people who are yeah, moonlighting, yeah, it would be a great thing. Uh, location controls, it's, it's a, a modern, a, a new thing, right? I'm sorry, I'm in the office, I can't run my rogue program. Uh, I'm out of my office, I can't run my calendar program, my, my work calendar program. That would be really cool. Uh, and it doesn't have to be dull. It's like, do something fun. Um, access controls based on Gosh, whether you're on a boat. I, yeah. um, because we, we're in, a, in an era now where we actually have module stacking, um, at least to some extent, getting better, better every day now, um, you don't have to say, well, we're running SE Linux, so we can't do that. Well, you can. So you know, come up with good things, and you know, let's just make, make things better. And with that, we'll open up to, to general questions. I know we're running just a little bit late, but any questions? Okay. Kishi, could you give us some examples of when the hooks are called not in the current process context, I assume probably incoming. Networking hooks. Only networking. That's the. Right, incoming the, the, packet, the, obviously, yeah, yeah. we don't those, know. Those right? are the ones I know of off the top of my head. Um, I haven't investigated some of the things like the, the tunes Okay. Okay. All, all okay. process hooks, fork, exactly. Generally, all, yeah. All right. Yeah. You'll, right. you'll find. Yeah, you'll find out if you if you're not. All right. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I'm 
break now. No, thanks. Okay. okay, so we're into the break now, so perhaps there could be okay. a boff if people are interested. Okay, so later. here's the deal. Everybody who asks the question, come forward here, and, and we will have a, a, a contest as to who gets, who gets the, uh, the raspberry pie. Um, if you didn't get to ask a question and you wanted to and you want to be in the contest, come up and we'll, we'll do the same. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. And just to mention, the, uh, the coffee situation is now that we are sharing coffee from next door, so just go in next door. Uh, I'm not sure if this is an upgrade or a downgrade. We'll have to see. <laughs>